inserted into the discussion uh, as far as possible. So here we are with, uh, let's say, the Clusters 2.0 project. Clusters 2.0 started uh, in May 2017 as a uh, EU-funded Horizon 2020 project uh, with about 30 partners. So this is quite ambitious in the consortium construction. We had uh, academics, uh, industry, research institutes, uh, private consulting, uh, a lot of also shippers, manufacturers, a, a big variety of, uh, of uh, any logistics uh, stakeholder uh, that could play a role in the clusters context. We started at that time with a kind of vision that we want to, that we saw a lot of potentials that could be leveraged. And uh, we saw that uh, uh, there is a big, um, let's say, um, um, stakeholder or a big uh, entity that could take this up. And we define these as logistics clusters. Here, let's say efficiency, sustainability, and also the integration of transport modes could take place. And this was our research vision in order to find out what kind of uh, enablers, disablers, technologies, communication approach could facilitate the setup of clusters and the performance of logistics operations. When looking at logistics clusters, we can see all over Europe uh, several appearances of clusters. So these can be agglomerations, uh, logistics activities across Europe. So for example, like uh, ports, triports, Eight uh, villages, industry clusters, like for example in the automotive industry. Uh, these are visible appearances of clusters or so of economic activity at a geographic point. Within the uh, clusters project, we followed the concept of uh, modularization, connectivity, collaboration to optimize supply chain and freight operations across Europe. Starting point was the idea that uh, collaboration among shippers by cooling their freight demand could exploit huge potentials for intermodal transport. Um, and these potentials we wanted to leverage within the logistics clusters. Um, we surveyed uh, clusters activities from different angles. We had an approach which was called massification methodology that we tested in various clusters in Duos, Duisburg, Trelleborg, Saragossa, Pireus, and Bologna. We developed a tool that uh, was uh, what's called quick check tool to quickly analyze cor corridor volumes uh, across Europe. There was a better tool that uh, addressed the, uh, let's say the intermodal demand potential it was called X intermodal addressing the tactical planning level to exploit the potentials uh, on a real order level on the supply chain. Clearly, all is about the need for collaboration um, by means of adapt adopting freight plans and to create visibility and transparency. Especially for our shippers, it is the question, what kind of intermodal services are, are available? How can I make use of them? And how can I make a booking uh, via system that is available. Um, this research topic was mainly taken up by the cluster community system um, that, um, that was uh, <clears throat> looking at intermodal services that was published by uh, intermodal transport operators called GTS. This intermodal service was uh, feeded into a cluster community system and made available then for an X intermodal tool, but also for, for a, a, a community system so that visibility could be created across the whole supply chain. Uh, in a third, in a third step, we added modularization to this concept to make better use of transport capacity by stocking, by stacking and cooling cargo along the journey. This resulted in additional savings across the supply chain. A new loading unit was adapted that can be fast that, load, that can that can fastly load and unload, speeding up cross docking processes. We also look into uh, automated transshipment and loading activities that is uh, now technically feasible 
and pave the way for new concept for intermodal train, uh, train loading and unloading. And finally, also a dynamic IT tool such as the slot booking app was developed in the context of Cluster 2.0 and tested in the context of Brussels and Heathrow airport operations. Here we can speed up the dwell time at the points through coordinated process within the port operations. All these components um, that we develop, um, wanted to uh, we want to show in a series of uh, webinars that you can see here. So we start right now with a kind of opening webinar where we said we want to rethink collaboration, connectivity, and modularization for the key elements of our project activities. Then we go into the cloud-based platform collaboration in airport clusters. Here we look mainly for the uh, uh, clusters of the, the slot booking app activities in Brussels and in uh, Israel. Then we want to give you an introduction about the NMLU. This is taking place on the 2nd of July in a dedicated webinar. And also uh, we look at logistics clusters as a foundation for a collaboration and model shift. This is looking at the massification uh, methodology, the X intermodal and quick check tool. Uh, then we have a webinar on cloud-based platform collaboration and intermodal clusters. This will take place on 9th of July and addressing the cluster community systems, linking with the X intermodal, but also the pod community system of Trieste. And finally, we have a logistics cluster as key driver for a European Green Deal. This will address the uh, uh, impact assessment and innovation management that we implemented into the clusters project. So right now, we are here in this webinar. It's an opening webinar, and uh, we want to discuss about what are the lessons learned. So starting from a high-level approach, uh, what are the lessons learned out of the uh, innovations that we have developed in the clusters 2.0? assign value to these innovations with regards to the current and future flight operation and business processes then we want to look at the changes that are needed to move forward and finally we want to let's say highlight from an uh, let's say continuation level what kind of solutions that we have developed in the clusters project would have the highest potential to continue um, discussing this i am very happy to introduce to you um for three experts that we have in our activity i would like to start with fernando lisa he is uh, secretary general of the alice uh, european technology platform we have uh, eric Ballo, who is professor at min parin tech uh, in paris and we have also michael archer from chap he is a uh, market director I would say for, for business development and innovations, but uh, possibly you can introduce yourself much better than I can do. So starting possibly with Fernando, who is on right top of me, if you could some, tell some brief words about who you are and uh, your link to the Clusters 2.0 project. Hello everybody, this is uh, Fernando Lies. I'm the Secretary General of Alice, the Alliance for Logistics Innovation for Collaboration in, in Europe. I think you need to mute, uh, Marcel. If not, uh, we hear a lot of echo. And uh, and uh, indeed, uh, as Alice, uh, one of our activities is really looking into uh, uh, what's happening in, in terms of trends and visions for logistics, and providing recommendations on the on the research and innovation programs. And actually, uh, clusters uh, 2.0 came out of uh, one of the calls. And uh, feeling that did that work program, we were proposing three different uh, uh, lines of action that ended uh, in uh, one uh, project. As you see uh, from the presentation of Marcel, they were not doing one project; they were doing at least three projects with some sub projects. And and this is uh, uh, our initial contact. And then also cluster 2.0 is a, a project lies uh, with alice so we have more than 20 projects lies with alice uh, and then we look into the outputs of these projects and how these outputs match into our 
uh, research and innovation uh, roadmaps so then we can assess the implementation of the roadmaps. So that's for, all for the moment. Thank you very much, Fernando. Eric, if you could introduce yourself. Okay, Eric, yes. Uh, yeah, I was waiting for the unmute from the organizer. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my pleasure to be here, with, here virtually with you today. Uh, I am a professor at Min Paris Tech, so an engineering uh, uh, university in Paris, and uh, I'm also one of the founder of the Physical Internet Concept, and the Clusters 2.0 project is something that is very close to what we could say the, the backbone of uh, European uh, pan-European pan uh, physical internet, and uh, I, it's also I think in line with uh, a former project, the first one, Modulushka, which was uh, very limited in the sector and uh, with small boxes. And here we investigated uh, what kind of uh, system could be developed uh, at the pan-European level, starting with clusters as. Uh, uh Marcel mentioned and uh, with big nodes and corridors and so on and we co could go into the details uh, uh in the following steps um about what we did exactly in uh, clusters on our side uh, we were mo mostly involved in the assessment value assessment of uh, nmlu new modular logistics units uh, and their impact on uh, the supply chain and transportation and transshipment. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Michael? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me again, like Eric and Fernando and Marcel, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, my, my role is market development director, which basically means I'm responsible for doing the things that chat doesn't do at the moment. So what are the other things and ways we, we could add value out there in the marketplace? Um, for those of you who are not familiar with chat, we are a um, reusable packaging management company, best known for the blue wooden pallets that underpin a lot of the product that ends up in the supermarkets where you buy your groceries but also containers of parts that end up in automotive assembly plants all over Europe and all over the world. Um, and you know what, what our role in this, I've been sitting on the high level industry group for clusters for the last couple of years. And there are two particular areas that I bring. One is as a reusable packaging management company, if the NL, NL, MLU concept is to get off the ground, the question is what's necessary, not just to design it, but to make it work in practice. Uh, and to make it a genuinely reusable and managed piece of equipment. And the other area of interest is that I've spent 11 years, like so many of you, working around transport collaboration. I bear the scars of failures. I have um, a number of successes as well. Um, and we've been working with, with customers all over Europe in terms of saying what makes collaboration um, successful and how do you make it happen? And clearly one of the, the big questions in all of this is we need that collaboration to happen on a much bigger scale than it's happening today if we're going to achieve what we need to achieve. So thank you then for all of you for the introduction. Um, as you as you recognize, uh, all of these participants have close links to Cluster 2.0. So Michael is part of the European High Level Industry Group that we established for Cluster 2.0 as well as Fernando. Nando is, uh, let's say, uh, accompanying the project from the beginning. So he was also one, one of the founder of these ideas to, uh, let's say, to research much more on logistics clusters in order to approach the physical internet. And Eric also, we, we have been together in the Modulushka project, a kind of, let's say, a pre-project or pre-initiative uh, that leads, that led to the, the cluster 2.0 project, all under the, let's say, framework of the physical internet. So, um, therefore, um, you're quite familiar with uh, the achievements and with the solutions that, that we have in the Cluster 2.0. Therefore, I would say we are now at the end of the project and we have to assign some value to the single solutions um, out of the context of physical internet, but also out of context of the logistics performance. Um, I would probably start with you, Michael. 
uh, what kind of value uh, value would you assign or associate to uh, to the clusters 2.0 solutions for the current and for the future freight operations and business processes? Okay, thank you, uh, Marcel. I think I mean, for me, my, one of the big learnings around here is that the areas the cluster has been working on are necessary but not sufficient for us to achieve what we need to achieve to deliver um, the supply chain of the future. So in terms of the efficiency we need to deliver, we've, the clusters has focused on a number of the critical areas uh, that need to be improved and addressed. Uh, but putting a, a sort of value in euros or dollars or anything else onto that is almost impossible because you need to move, we need to move forward lots of different things at the same time. Um, and so we could deliver the clusters just on its own. That's not enough. It needs to come across as the whole package. Thank you. So <clears throat> I said, okay, it's, it's a matter of collaboration then in the end. So, I mean, it's like the invention of the first telephone. It's useless for the, for the one who has invented it if there is no responding part. I, I would say this is, this is exactly mm -hmm. at this stage. So nice, but uh, <laughs> to, to uh, a scale up. Yeah. Eric, yeah. if you want to add something. Up. Yes, if I may jump in, jump in. Uh, it's nice to have a phone. Uh, it's nice to have uh, 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 to be able to communicate with someone with a phone from the same company. <laughs> but it's even better <laughs> if you are able to communicate with people with phones and uh, subscription from other companies. And this is where uh, interconnection takes place. Mm -hmm. And I think it's at the core of what we do in clusters uh and it's uh one of the value of clusters 2.0 to investigate what do we need to gather uh flows together so uh, we could have a more significant flows and, and bundles so intermodal solutions make sense uh on on one hand it's also a part of the uh, the value of uh, clusters 2.0 to investigate uh physical solutions like nmlu new modular six uh, unit to ease uh, the transshipment and, and reduce the cost and the, the lead time, the transit time, which is usually um, uh, a barrier against uh, intermodal uh, collaboration. And uh, it's also uh, interesting to have some kind of business model to, to help uh, that kind of new solution. Thank you, Eric. So if, just to summarize, it's it's about it's about then in the end we have from clusters a lot of enabling technologies or so let's say uh, enabling components that that will facilitate collaboration but also modularization and physical internet approaches, uh, and then it's a matter of how to best uh, let's say implement them and let's say combine them possibly into kind of a future you know, operations but also solutions or, or technologies. Uh, Fernando, so if you have some. Yeah, on, on my side, uh, uh, I, and I fully agree with uh, Michael, I, I think Cluster 2.0 has been working uh, for a while on three different uh, key streams uh, uh, to get uh, uh, physical internet in place, but uh, with uh, limited resources, so focus on very concrete and specific uh, elements that I think are quite uh, valuable, but are only, uh, they are only part of a much bigger uh, uh, picture. And, and then it's uh, how you can, uh, so then in that side, the, the value is, is clear, but as Michael said, it's not, it's not enough. It's a, a matter of uh, take up of, uh, of the solutions, uh, but also working with the stakeholders address, the clusters or the SIPAs, really to uh, get to the next uh, to the next uh, level and uh, i think from an analyst perspective we don't see uh, clusters 2.0 in uh, isolation so there are a number of other projects that have been working in this area and for example one of the assessments in between the uh, the cluster 2.0 is that we see uh, to get uh, CIPAs uh, to collaborate uh, and to organize and to orchestrate uh, collaboration among them is quite quite complex. And now there are other models uh, that could enable this collaboration. So for example, Michael maybe could refer to their zero waste initiative where 
there are uh, there is a third party that can have this capability and at the end make uh, the collaboration uh, simple. And I, I think this is the the value added. Uh, uh, it's needed. So how you uh, make collaboration happening and getting the benefit of bundling and maybe modal shift as well without uh, the need of the uh, of the startup cost of collaboration and that's one of the main learnings uh, in this in this period then the second one i think it's on the uh, on the nmlu and that at the end and the idea behind this was could we do the at intermodal terminals cross docking uh, platform uh, for NMLU? So then could have a network of uh, hubs and clusters instead of having point to point uh, transport. And I think this was uh, very much uh, forward looking uh, thinking and still could be uh, more done in that in that area. While there are other areas, so for example, the slot booking in airports and how to handle a slots in in airports we see this now it's really close to market in in many ports and also in in airports so i think uh, many different uh, uh, streams many different uh, uh, learnings although you made a lot of effort you made a lot of work i think that the 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 work is to be done still is much more even <laughs> That's true, for sure, for sure. I, I think we we started with, I would say, with about uh, six, seven, we, we called it solutions or innovations around that. Uh, and I think what, what is common for all of them is they are fragments. So this, these, are, these are, let's say, when looking at the new modular loading units, this is a, let's say, this is a, a, a plate or a technology system which is facilitating cross-docking. So it's it's one element out of in, within the whole, let's say, cross-docking process uh, that can add some added value and on, on the whole operations. However, it's not revolu re revolutionizing this the, the whole the whole system. So therefore, it's a kind of um, let's say evolutionary uh, approach. So you implement something, you look is it's getting better or let's say it's not getting better. Probably you have some some ways and better to adapt this and to improve this and to get into a kind of innovation process in, into that. And uh, these technologies, we have about seven to eight of them. Um, and so this is my my question. So probably we, we should dive a little bit deeper into this topic um, about what are the key enablers then when we are looking for physical internet and uh, let's say collaborative operations. Making, I mean, the way the way to achieve this is always uh, to, let's say, via or over more efficiency, uh, not leaving out sustainability considerations. However, logistics is driven by costs and by efficiency operations, so you just can implement something once it is uh, more efficient, meaning it's cost saving. So this is the, the key driver. However, when we're looking at the different kind of solutions, what kind of potential would you associate to this? Uh, to these uh, solutions. What are for you the key enablers or the, the lessons learned on the key enablers on these different kind of solutions? Possibly you pick out one or two or you, let's say, address all of them, uh, but possibly you have a view on that. So possibly, Michael, would you ask? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. start? Okay, so, so we, we have a pleasure, absolutely. The, the key enablers from my years around collaboration and collaborative transport, so both within clusters and prior, and, uh, prior to clusters, the single biggest enabler of transport collaboration is a really firm eye on the prize that you're trying to address it's actually the real clarity is what's the problem how much is it worth because collaboration can be difficult i mean no, no question about that but if you've got a really clear eye on what's at stake and what the prize is then the difficulties become things to, over, to be overcome as opposed to reasons to stop and give up and go home um, so for me one of the, the absolute critical pieces is that and then the second part for me is actually recognizing that everything we do in logistics is adding to the organism. Logistics is not a machine, right? It doesn't, you, you press a button, everything doesn't work automatically. It's more organic than that. It grows and develops. And what, what we need to do and what we are, have been doing in clusters is trying to operate on those critical places where if we, if we can grow something somewhere, everything else can then start building around it. So the ecosystem starts to adapt. 
So if I talk about NMLU, for example, NMLU fits in a family of modular um, items from the sort of 40 foot and 20 foot shipping containers down through an NMLU, which is, you know, fits within a shipping container, contains four pallets to the pallet, then to then the modular sizes, the crates and the boxes that fit on a pallet down to the individual consumer units that sit within them, that sit on the shelf and that you take home in your shopping. And it's not perfect, this family of modu modular items, but it is a family of items. And the critical piece around NMLU is saying, what's its role within the family? So there are occasions when NMLU is too small, we should be using a shipper container. There are occasions when it's too big, we should be using a pallet. Yeah, but there are occasions when what you need is something that enables you to cross dock four pallets at a time as efficiently as possible. And that I think is critical to this vision of clusters, particularly within the intermodal links and how you enable smaller scale operators to ship consignments that, that don't take an entire wagon, but take part of a wagon and how you consolidate those efficiently and get them across. Um, across the piece. So for me, those those are some of the key enablers. And then link into that clearly all the things around visibility, particularly I think visibility of opportunity. So it, it's this whole piece around knowing when the freight trains are going and being able to book them. And just in the same way that you and I, if we're, if we're flying somewhere for our personal, we're quite used to going online and seeing what flights are available and and and, and booking something directly through that. Well, I, I say one of the things I learned personally from clusters was that that sort of system didn't already exist for freight trains across Europe. <laughs> Sorry, muted. Um, Eric, so you want to continue on that? Um, yes, maybe. Uh, I think that uh, talking about uh, enablers and barriers uh, for uh, clusters 2.0, I think one of the main barriers that we have to overcome is that, um, and I fully agree what this was said by uh, Michael, but the, the, what I would call the inland paradox. Uh, when you have sea shipping, air shipping, it is mandatory to pass through port or an airport. <laughs> uh, so there is some kind of natural hubs, uh, because uh, except for a few players, very, 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 very few, uh, you're not able to offer your own infrastructure. So somehow uh, players are forced to gather together at the, in the same place and, and share assets. Doesn't mean that they really collaborate together all the way. Uh, they have, of course, some minimum coordination between them, but most of the business is done without collaboration. And I would say even with some uh, high degree of competition uh, between them, competition in, in the, on the offer and also competition between the uh, between the shippers to have access to the capacity uh, at the best price. So here, uh, the good thing for inland transportation is that you can, you can send anything from anywhere to anywhere, <laughs> almost uh, quite easily. And what is one of the high barrier we have to uh, overcome in, in uh, clusters, but not only clusters uh, project, is the fact that we, and, and it's the big innovation that we want to uh, somehow um partially replace a uh, ad hoc network which is one-to-one -one, uh, mostly to something that is more structured with economies of scales and economies of scope but uh something that is comes with some constraints and of course uh we, among the constraints as mentioned uh the first thing is it should be uh, a cost saving solution so uh, and even from day one which is not obvious, uh, you, you should start cheaper. Um, another thing is, it could be also a barrier, uh, and it was mentioned uh, at some point, is the you should provide at least the same service level, uh, no delay and no uh, one year ahead the scheduling, because <laughs> it's not exactly what is expected from uh, many shippers. Uh, so between the constraints of the, the infrastructure and the flexibility needed at the, the on the demand side uh there is a need of adjustment uh in between uh, and i think that clusters uh bring things but there are more to to do uh in that area how to decouple uh the demand and the flexibility needed by the shippers from the constraints 
uh, from the infrastructure, both transportation and transshipment. But I think also there is something that so far is still nice to have, which is sustainability. And of course, when you go into model, usually it comes with a huge impact on sustainability. And I just want to remember the last crisis, uh, the Corona crisis, which is uh, if you sh mostly uh, shut down the world for three months, uh, you save only three weeks uh, on natural resources consumption, which is, I think, not really a good news. O of course, you can say with actual technology and without any preparation and all kind of disclosure. But anyway, uh, it means that uh, if we want to reach uh, the 60%, uh, it would not happen uh, <laughs> like that, or it will not happen uh, with uh, serious changes in uh, transport technologies and transport organization. And the last point I want to mention, um, it was not the, the, the big deal in, uh, in, in clusters 2.0 at the beginning, but uh, is the resilience of the network approach. Uh, because if you're talking right now about lanes or about uh, corridors, you're still stuck on the solution and the route. But if you follow the idea of clusters 2.0 and the network uh, connecting big nodes clusters, uh, it means that uh, if you you may have several routes uh, available to reach a market. And uh, I think it's uh, also a, a new value uh, that we can see uh, in uh, what we did in uh, in clusters 2.0. That it was not two or three years ago something that was really <laughs> mind blowing, but I think that right now it's something that it's much more in the mind of uh, many players. Uh, if I consider many many recent crises like Brexit, like uh, Corona crisis. Um, uh, climate change and uh, the forthcoming ones for sure and they will be all together uh, for sure we need uh, alternates and more resilient solutions and maybe alone is not the best way hmm. that's true that's true for sure but i think you, you raised a very interesting point and this is uh, in my view it's a goes in the direction of uh, service levels of ser service oriented offerings in the end so you are uh, i mean Presently, I would say the whole procurement process in uh, in logistics is that that you have, let's say, these full truck load, less truck load, and and parcel probably. So, however, um, this service idea is not really implemented. So, when taking the analogy of of, of airports, it is you sit into a into an aircraft, uh, you know that the, the your neighbor next to you can be a competitor from from your company, and he's paying a complete different price than you do. So. Uh, but no one cares in the end. So it is, it is uh, let's say, transfer this idea on logistics is seems to be not possible then in the end. So this is, this is uh, let's say, so much uh, reluctance and barriers in the market that, that these, these, let's say, habits, uh, how you buy and how you book uh, freight um, capacity is still, let's say, in a very traditional way. And Marcel, if I may follow your analogy, it's even worse. It could be worse than a competitor. You may be afraid of your neighbor. You don't trust him at all. This is why you have all the security measures at the airport. So to, to say that we overcome already a lot of barriers to allow to share uh, an aircraft, because I think that we are very, maybe very few or maybe not allowed in the room to have your our own aircraft go to one place or another uh, but it's much more easier to rent a, 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 um, a truck and this is what most of the company they could afford this is why we have here a barrier to because there is a, a benchmark solution that is quite easy cheap reliable and uh, so this is why we, this is what we have to overcome. But I think link, links into as well, the sort of whole public transport piece. I mean, one of the challenges I think around the whole concept of collaborative transport is that actually you look at public transport and you know, every plane to New York until recently, every train on the system, most buses right, are full of people, none of whom needed to collaborate in order to buy an individual seat. 
all you needed was a published timetable on a route that people wanted to use. Yeah, and, so, and, and, and the sort of pricing model that enables you to buy individual seats as opposed to having to buy the whole plane and then try and find other people to try and share the, share the risk with you. So I think one of the things we need to recognize is that collaboration is not necessarily the goal. The goal is much more around resilience and efficiency and low cost and low carbon and all those sorts of things. Collaboration is a means to an end. And in some cases, the barriers of collaboration, we can just bypass them and come up with different business models that would enable us to achieve what we want to achieve without the collaboration at all. Yes. Just before giving the word to, to, to Fernando, we had very exactly this experience in the in the uh, let's say the cluster community system in Bologna. So there was the publishing of GTS, so it's an intermodal operator, um, that published its 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 timetable. And and to me it is this is one of the first time that someone is uh, collaboratively publishing uh, timetables towards a platform. And this platform is distributing it then to, let's say, to a port community system, to terminal operators. And via the uh, X intermodal system, it's also uh, made accessible then for shippers in order to integrate into the planning. So the whole process is there. However, there is partly the demand to, to, to have this information because <laughs> this, is, this seems to me to be very strange that even if this is technically feasible, there is hardly the demand to to uh, to have this information at, at site because even if you have it, your let's say your your commercial habit is not um, um, uh, in line with that. So you traditionally procure. This means you you make a request to uh, to a different kind of logistic service provider. You have lanes. You you, you uh, let's say you you ask for quotations, and then the one that is uh, providing the lowest quotation, he gets it. But I think we come back to this to this point, and, and I think this goes all in the direction of disablers rather than enablers. Uh, but I would like to give the floor to uh, to, to Fernando and uh, to, on his view on this. Actually, I think I, I want to build uh, on, on three elements. Uh, first one is building on the resiliency part that uh, I think it's, uh, it's an important part. The second one is on the omni-channel. And the third one is on, on climate change. On resiliency is not only on looking into what uh, Eric said on the, on the network, that it's very important because then you, you made your network more resilient. It's also that we have seen this uh, in this crisis is that while we had many of the resources with nothing to do because that sector was closed down, closed down so then we have many ideal capacity in some segments, there were no capacity because the, the constraints on how we built our uh, supply chain tools are very oriented to a specific uh, segment. While if we look into the family, what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Michael was saying uh, at the end, this could make all these assets, meaning uh, transport modes, meaning uh, containers, meaning boxes, much more transferable from one supply chain to another. And, and that's the whole concept of this physical internet is how you can build uh, tools that can be shared across different supply chains. And, and actually this is a, a major point of resiliency. And we have seen, I, we have had members almost uh, uh, closing to the 10, 15% of the capacity and even some of them in parts 15, 20% and in other parts of their, of their services going 150 and they, they didn't have the means inside to, to fit the, that, that uh, requirement. So that's why I think it's uh, important in resiliency. Then on omnichannel is that now we can buy and sell in many different ways from many different places. We can receive our goods in various forms. So this meaning that we are very fragmenting the flows and fragmenting the, the way we receive the flows. So then at the end, there is uh, no way that we can imagine we can have not only a, a plane for us, it's a plane for us for this and then a plane for us for that. It's then, and, and then this is creating a lot of um, cost burden on this omnichannel. And that's why you can see uh, many important retailers looking into this uh, omni-channel, how they can really now serve from 
multi, uh, they are making their stores as inventory centers, they manage it integrated, and then they can ship from everywhere to everywhere. And that's uh, already advancing pretty much in our, in our thinking in, in, uh, in uh, physical internet. This morning we had a, a webinar with Iconet project on the living lab with tonight was uh, essentially on this. And then the third one is on climate. The problem we have is that here it's the cost of the transition and the price that was mentioned by Michael. And then the same, if, if the cost of transition is not enough, I can be inefficient, but who cares? The problem we have now is that in, uh, with climate change, we'll see a lot of push here. We'll need to uh, indeed invest in new assets, zero tile pipe uh, road vehicles, new SIPs, new whatever, and this seems to be by far much more expensive of current assets. So then this will make inefficiency be a cost uh, factor much more important. If uh, we want to meet uh, transport, if we want to meet climate change, we'll need transport, it's going to be much more expensive. So then the transition cost will be much lower than the price. And that's, that's the enabler. So then at the end, maybe uh, we are not that in that point, but I think in, in two, three, five years, most of the work that has been done in clusters will be very meaningful. Some of the work is already meaningful, but in two, three years, I think it will be much more meaningful. Okay. And if I could okay. pick up that, pick up that comment about transport being more expensive and going forward, I think one of the things that's been really striking in supply chains the last five or 10 years has been the obsession with reducing inventory and moving things just in time. It was a time when interest rates have been as close to zero as any of us can ever remember. Yeah, we seem to be utterly obsessed with taking one or two days out of inventory because back before 2008, people's business models was, were driven by volume growth and volume growth enabled efficiency, which enabled you to cut costs, which enabled you to drop prices. When the European economy to a certain extent went X growth after 2008, people started replacing that with something built based on a cash model, which relied on them taking cash out of the system all the time through inventory. And one of the ways they did that was by making um, consignment sizes smaller and more frequent, which, again, which then drove the inefficiency in transport that Fernando is talking about. Uh, so I think all of these things are interrelated and we, uh, and we need to find a, a, a different way through them. I would like to come back on your, on your point of the price. So when, when we take, let's say, this, this, this abstract abstract uh, uh, picture of a price for something and yeah. i mean in the end we are we are talking about here of a kind of transformation process so we have we have now i mean we all want to achieve this physical internet that is that is uh, let's say much more efficient sustainable and and uh, as eric said so it's not so easy to achieve uh, additional um, 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 energy and and co2 savings um, out of just producing less so it Saving is not that much as expected, so we need to change much more radical uh, in the way. And, and the question is, uh, how can we do that? And uh, I mean, this is the way to better use the capacity, to better pool, to better stack, to uh, let's say make more efficient how your streams are flowing. And uh, we did a lot of surveys in this context in the Cluster 2.0 project, uh, looking at corridors, uh, how the potential is, and let's say using uh, uh, especially intermodal services can be one way to do that. I think here is a lot of potential in this, in this uh, transport system. We can also use better filled trucks, more filled trucks. Um, possibly the, let's say the remaining or the residual potential is not that high. However, the question is coming back to this price question. So, and the transformation. So where is a reasonable or where is the price more most reasonable call it like that so where where, where to start so where is the problem where that we that we can negotiate as a let's say with with the best label um, um, in terms of price and in terms of uh, let's say outcome and achievements does any one of you so I, I will not direct to, to anyone but possibly Michael you you have you, have, you might have an, an opinion or an answer to that I have, you know, I have an opinion on most things. So whether whether it's right is another question, but at least it's a, and based on my limited experience. But um, 
I think in a lot of these areas, you know, the focus on prize is all about motivation, right? It's a, you know, if I go back to the early days of collaboration, we always used to start by proving something was possible. Yeah, and, and almost inevitably we ground to a halt after we proved it was possible because actually no, it, was, it was possible but difficult. And that wasn't enough to give it the momentum to take it forward. Now we focus the other way around, right? We, we focus on understanding what the value, what the prize, whether that's expressed in money or CO2 or, or resilience or whatever we're, we're looking to measure it in and saying, look, get a real clear idea of where the prize is. And then once you once you start focusing on that, you then inevitably focus on, well, who has the most? Where is the biggest prize? You know, you think back to all the theory of innovation and innovation development, you know, and the early adopters tend to be the people who are willing to try something despite the fact it's not yet a perfect solution. It may be more expensive than it will be in five years' time. All the tool, all the ecosystem that surrounds it doesn't yet exist. We talked about telephones earlier. Right, you know, people will first users of mobile phones could only talk to people on the same mobile phone network, right? But there were a few people who were willing to do that. That brought down the cost of the equipment, which made they then access the next piece. So this completely remorseless focus on where is the prize, how what's the big prize, and where's the biggest prize, and we stop thinking about averages and start saying, okay, who has most and least? So, for example, if I take as an example. And this is an inland example, not um, specific to clusters necessarily. But, um, you know, I'm working with a number of different trade associations around Europe around, you know, how do we fill trucks better? Right? And you tend to start from a situation where, you know, if you look at the government statistics, it says that the average truck, even when it's not empty, is only about 55% full. Right? If you look into the reality on the ground in terms of what's happening in, in grocery supply chains coming into a retailer, it's probably near a 65 to 70% full in terms of what's coming in. But what you've got is a lot of full trucks, right? And a lot of very empty trucks were coming through to an average. And, you know, part of what we're recognizing is that the opportunity there isn't with the Coca-Cola's delivering into the car fours, right? Because they, they have enough to do a full truck every day, right? Or several full trucks every day. The opportunity is more likely to lie with the medium-sized suppliers into the bigger retailers Right, or the, the big and medium sized suppliers into the medium sized retailers. Yeah. And so it's getting it under the skin, recognizing if that's where the prize is, then there's no point trying to focus on that problem by solving it on the Coca Cola to car for leg because there's no prize there to solve. Right. So, so for me, it's about recognizing the prize overall. It's then consciously looking away from the average and saying, where is the biggest element of it? And how do we address it? I mean, if I look at, we mentioned Brexit earlier, we talked about, you know, we talked about shipping earlier. You know, the UK is overwhelmingly dependent on the inflow into Dover, right? That's a massive issue from a resilience point of view in terms of all the food that we depend on for imports. And so the question, one from a resilience point of view, the question would be, what do we need to do to increase the capacity on ferry routes coming through different ports, which will reduce the choke point which, which has huge benefits for lots of different people, right, in terms of how we do it. So I think it's identifying a few of those really critical points, depending on the prize and going after them. And then it's about finding somewhere you can actually start. You know, I, I'm fond of the, the belief that you know, if you need to cross a, a big fast flowing river and there isn't a bridge in any direction, then you have to look for stepping stones. You've got to look for a way across and you need to find a stone that takes you part way across but stable enough you don't get washed over, over into the water as it goes through while you look forward to decide where to go next. And I think for us, that's our big challenge now with the next stage of clusters is moving some of these forward, but identifying what's that first application that can be delivered um, where the, there are a small number of players getting together can make it happen. Okay, this will be really a, a quite interesting. Uh, okay, that would be the qu the next question. <laughs> what this could, but uh, I think let's let's make first uh, uh, let's say uh, let's say involve the other speakers as well. So, from your side, um, what? Eric, yeah, uh, maybe I want to add one thing. Uh, I fully agree with we're talking about truckload that the big players they can manage quite well uh, uh, truckloads. But 
there are the others, but there is also uh, the uh, multimodal transportation, where even big players are usually not big enough to uh, feel uh, transportation mean like a train or uh, a vessel or even a budget. So uh, here, what we face, I think, is um, a market that is much more complex and the complexity of, uh, and the value of the market that is needed here, uh, we start with collaboration with few players, but the, the idea is not to go all the way uh, with collaboration because we know uh, in Europe at 28 or at 27, it's already quite complicated. But the idea is to set up platforms or intermediaries that will be able to close the gap between uh, the offer, some kind of a high capacity fixed uh, planning and not so easy to, to adapt, and the demand that is quite flexible that is coming from big but also small and medium players and then for the medium players it's really hard for them to address and to access to multimodal transportation for them it's like uh, compared to a, a truck you just have to take your phone or send a, a fax or <laughs> or send an email and you have a truck next to your door if you want to come do all the operations to go from the truck that will pick up from your door go to a train, do the all the kind of uh, process and operations, and um, plus the liability insurances are behind. And if you say that you have to book that months in advance, then no way. So what I think is, and what we worked on in different ways, uh, with clusters, with the, uh, the stream, the cloud, and everything, is that, of course, if we need to start with the, by gathering, uh, flows from big players, at some point there is still a need to uh, invent some mechanism to, um, uh, with some high value to close the gap, to transform a fixed capacity offer long-term planning, planning into something that is, uh, you are ready to jump in. Yeah. And uh, it is something that we see also, if I come back to the, to the airlines, the airlines, they do it, but they have also systems like Amadeus and the other booking system where they do overbooking and everything, and they change the price, they adjust the price all the way uh, from uh, one year in advance uh, to the last minute. So you can always jump in and everybody is almost happy at the end, uh, <laughs> of course, with different prices for everyone. But mechanism uh, to adjust the demand of the offer with long-term planning and short-term planning is, is already available in, in other sectors. What is still needed here uh, is to invent that kind of mechanism. And I think that NMLU is a, a, is a right way to simplify because then you have to sell something that is like a seat. There is no big discussion. <laughs> like, uh, is it, uh, is it uh, solid? Is it, uh, can we put something on top? Uh, uh, yes, you have a side, but there is nothing that is, they exceed that side or <laughs> all kind of questions you have with the general cargo. It just vanished with the NMLU. Very interesting, yeah. Fernando, you have view and opinion as well about. So I pretty much agree with uh, Michael and and uh, Eric. Uh, Eric said so. Then I, I'm 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 not going to add uh, anything. I think it's. Uh, I think very well address the the question. Uh, I would I would like to again take this up. So I, I have some very good points right now. So I think um, so, Michael, you you addressed the, the the question. So what is the first layout to start? So so kick this off and and well, so how how could this how could this look like? So uh, Eric, you 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 raised the question of of the scale and what happens to the SMEs. So I mean, once we are in such a I think we, when we are when we are in such an operation, for sure, if we put all in one, let's say in one planning algorithm and say what is the best layout, okay, this is then this is then optimization. However, the market is it's very fragmented, so we have a lot of SMEs. We don't have we have these uh, we don't have these pooling capacities, not this willingness to do that. So we have different transport systems to do that. 
So it's not a let's say it's it's a it's a market result rather than the some something that is coming out of an optimization uh, uh, approach. And the question is, so how how can we how can we let's say move towards the, this optimization and what are the, the right framework or ecosystem uh, conditions in order to achieve that? And then you you raised the point about this uh, let's say taking the NMLU as a kind of standard for um, for um, let's say freight operations so that that we are not that we are not dealing with FTL, LTL, or parcels, but that we are dealing then with uh, LT, uh, NMLU uh, as a standard. Uh, so this is a slot. Uh, possibly we have some smaller sizes then as well. So um, but I think what is needed in order to to come to that. So what? So so how could we kick this off? So how can we get this started? So this is this is. I think these are the crucial ideas. So the it is there. I think it's recognized. But what to do in order to to get this off? Fernando. Yeah, indeed. I I think uh, what you said is right. But I I think we don't know. We don't need so much uh, the tech. So then we, the 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 barrier or the bottleneck is not in the technology on the capability. It's really in in the business. Uh, business commitment or business uh, orientation. And, and the question for me is in two direct directions. Is first of all, when it will be a moment in which uh, some CPOs are more freely uh, developing a framework of collaboration with their suppliers, sellers, logistic service providers, so they can really maximize the utilization of the network and the capability and resources. because now i think one of the issues is that CPOs give uh, uh, logistic service co providers very very uh, strict uh, um, well uh, described uh, uh, contracts and then this does not allow so much uh, the logistic service providers to really have a, a good uh, or better utilization of their of their network because at the end even the biggest biggest logistic service providers they have a lot of capabilities but they cannot share many times these capabilities across different uh, uh, services. And this is one. The second one is that I think there is now, uh, uh, or it, it's a moment in which we can see a lot of investments in uh, startups uh, that are really addressing uh, this problem in logistics. So, but for the moment in the last five years, we're, the, the investment of capital in uh, uh, in logistics tech has gone to the to the roof from zero to to and, and then the question is how long it will take for one or many of these to really uh, be at uh, a, a higher scale so then for the moment we have some uh, uh, Alice members that are addressing these problems from a platform perspective and they are around 10 15 20 a million. The, the question is, would they, be, uh, would they become unicorns? Because then, when they become unicorns, and uh, then this could make uh, a little bit more the transition easier. And then I'm sure um, the companies uh, that are now uh, operating those services will have the capabilities to move a little bit more uh, to that uh, systemic. But it's uh, not only on, on the offering, it's on the demand where uh, this needs to change as well a bit. I think this is a very good point about that. So this is, uh, I would say, that the problem, the problem is that we don't have the first customer. And I, I think the, the task of a startup is to find the first customer. So then it's really the, the uh, let's say, the way to move forward would be to... to we have. But not at the right level. It's yes. still yeah. low, low level. And the question is, if those small SMEs would have a network, and then they can benefit from this, and then if this would go a little bit higher, because all our, our companies are really addressing very niche. So a smaller SME, so then they can offer the, the scale opportunity even if they are small. The question is, these business models would also reach uh, to the mass market, uh, what uh, Michael said. 
Yeah. I mean, okay, so uh, Michael, you, you have a lot of experiences, especially in this, uh, when we're talking about setting new standards for uh, for a pallet system or for, for, let's say, shipping unit systems. Um, yeah. I mean, possibly it's not easy as a startup to find uh, sufficient customers uh, that, that will take up this NMLU idea and, uh, let's say, scale this up. So there, there is a, this uh, probably, but yeah, you from Chap, you have, might have an own opinion of, on on that. So mm -hmm. how did the better fly or, or better yeah. be implemented into the market? Yeah. Well, I, th I think the first the first place that we we recognise is that we are part of an entire ecosystem, right? So the, the, one of the dangers here at the moment you start thinking that you're big in something and you can start changing the world on your own, then you're in trouble, right? The reality is that you know whether it's pallets, whether it's shipping containers, whatever the standard is that's there. The reason it works, the reason it's so efficient, is because the ecosystem has developed around it in terms of racking systems, forklift trucks, you know, convert container ships, port handling devices. The whole thing is developed around those standards, right? Which then makes the whole thing more and more and more efficient. So you're part of the whole thing. Now, the, the bad news is, of course, that trying to create a new ecosystem from scratch isn't a complete nightmare because you have to start off without any of that supporting framework right the the good news of course is that is whether or not you can adapt some of the ecosystem that's already there and it always comes back to this whole big question of about seeing a problem or a challenge that's big enough and immediate enough that people are willing to challenge the standard way of doing things and then finding somebody who can do it now my belief in i mean fmcg grocery is the bit that i know I know best. I think one of the opportunities that comes in here is through the rise over the last several years of the proportion of private label that's sold in supermarkets. It has meant that um, a lot of supermarkets have a huge visibility over what's coming through and they're importing things, not just fruit and vegetables, but other things from around the place. And one of the challenges maybe is to start saying, look, look how much more consolidation could you achieve if it was being organized from the point of view of the receiver rather than being organized from the point of view of the sender. Because most senders are shipping goods to lots of different places. <laughs> yeah. Whereas most receivers may have multiple suppliers who are, who, who are all over Europe, but they may well have a cluster of suppliers in a, in a particular part of Poland or a particular part of Italy or wherever it may be that they're bringing into their, their locations. So it may, have been, and of course, the other beauty of private label is that if, if the retailer decides they want to change something, they have to take their partners with them, but to a very large extent, they can make it happen. In a way that if you try and work with a big brand in the, from a supplier point of view, they can only change the way it operates if, let's say, 100 retailers agree to take part in the game. Um, so my suspicion is that a lot of this change will come because retailers with a private label um, perspective will look across their supplier base and say we can see the opportunity point one but secondly we can make it happen and once one of them makes it happen the other everybody will then be forced to follow where that opportunity is real this is a very interesting point so you will see that the uh, retailers could be one of the drivers of, of such a change this uh, this is a very interesting yeah. concept okay yeah. And we, we, yeah, I'm just saying we as chat clearly, you know, we we would, you know, we see ourselves as managers of reuse, the reusable packaging that the industry wants to use. Okay, mm -hmm. we're very happy to lead with the industry, right? But if if I go out and buy a million NMLUs and stick them in a pile somewhere, that's not going to encourage anybody to use them, right? Yeah. What I need to be willing to do is to invest alongside the demand. Um, so we're not the people who grow who create the market. As the as the demand becomes clear, we may well be part, a critical part of the ecosystem that helps it that helps it with the initial growth. Yes. Okay. Very interesting point. Eric, you want to add something on that? Maybe just a few words. Uh, I think that what is also needed, and I fully agree with what was said, and uh, maybe that. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to have uh, the chip point of view uh, uh, after the COVID crisis uh, to see if it goes, um, if it could be a push for reusable containers or things like that, because more and more we need to protect, be sure that nobody touch, blah, 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 blah. And um, it, 
is it going to help us or not? It's, it's a, I think it's still a question, but maybe you are uh, on the front line, so you, you have a better visibility than us. Uh, my only point is, I think that in such system, uh, that we should not uh, underlook the complexity of combining all the loads to make things work. Uh, um, in um, in the sea shipping, it's around few players, so uh, and and just one side, and it's already quite complex, and it took a long time to to establish uh, norms and and things, and we are facing exactly the same problem, but I think also we face another problem here, that uh, if we have a an intermediary to package uh, uh, the, the the cluster solution, let's say. Uh, into uh, a nice service, uh, it means that the intermediary should uh, really commit for the service level uh, because it is really uh, something needed by uh, uh, the shippers. And uh, to be able to commit, I think it, it, it requires um, uh, to be very, very strong uh, both uh, on the software to be sure that what was planned is going to be executed and uh, on the players, uh, so it's it's not so far from the what we call at some point the fourth party logistics uh, players that uh, we expected to pop up and that we still need at least in that particular uh, market. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I think we have we have uh, approached a little. Uh, in my view, we have. Uh, approach the continuation of, of some cluster solutions quite well. So we, we, we came and framed it, we, uh, let's say, approached then possible ways to move forward. And um, I, I was just writing down some uh, some some thoughts uh, out of your, what, what you have said right now. So in my view it is, and please correct me if, I'm, if I missed something here, but in my view is we first have to find out the, let's say, the right size for the, for the, for the, the right size for the price. <laughs> Call it like that. So it is. It is. We need to. We need to look what kind of problem is large enough in order to justify, or that that someone is investing enough in order to, to to implement it. So we need to find the right problem. Not every problem, let's say, is worth enough to 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 follow it. So I think we have to look at this one. So it sounds a little bit abstract, but I think this this needs to be identified. So and uh, we have we have provided some examples. So this is uh, probably. We need to look. So, what is what is the let's say how to bring or establish collaboration? So, it's not that that we need to probably um, um, implement for for each problem a, a huge circle of of different shippers, but probably create some frameworks of how how we can how we can establish collaboration among shippers, for example, in order to pool, rather than doing this one, then then being on the operational side. The second point is, and I think this is quite good. So we have different channels as well. So uh, in order to implement it, so we have on the one side we have the startups that that could help probably take up one or two solutions in order to to continue and and to look for scale how to how to implement this in the market. And and uh, uh, on the other side, this can also be a kind of uh, innovation out of the I would call established industry, looking at the retailer looking at the so i would say i would fully agree so we have done a lot of um uh, surveys with with shippers however their trucks are more or less full so it's a problem of let's say mixing it's a retailer problem in in my view so looking at them and how to establish these kind of uh, let's say consolidation filling the trucks pooling um, i think this can be a really a topic for them in order to improve efficiency and order to better drive the supply chain around that um, my final question on that would be, what kind of solution would you see has most of the potentials in order to, let's say, continue? Um, where do you see, um, where do you see most chances that that this solution, once it's getting into kind of market maturity, how can this be, um, um, let's say, further developed, or, or can this be further developed? Uh, what kind of potential is underlying? I think we make we make uh, one final round, so we have 15 minutes left. Starting with Fernando this time, um, what what kind of uh, use do you have on uh, the different clusters 2.0 solutions? 
which is your preferred one and would you see it to let's say to grow yeah one thing i i, I missed to say before is that on on the load factors I, I think at least from what i know there are some uh, companies that are starting to look into this in a different way because normally they were looking either on volume or on weight uh, and then uh, they say yes the track is full but it was full or either on volume or on weight mm -hmm. and uh, and and most of the times were was on weight and, and then this made a lot of a space at the at the at the top so then for for these uh, retailers or even brands with multiple uh, uh, with multiple brands within one company, they have realized that when they look into this from these two perspectives, they can they can they are not so fully loaded, and and they can even improve a lot. And I think this is something that I have seen already in some of the of the companies uh, in brands, but not so much on the logistic service providers or pooling or whatever, because I don't think they have this kind of flexibility. So there, I think, could be a, a, a good uh, point of uh, uh, addressing uh, the, the right question. So then when you said, Marcel, they said, we are full, you need to ask them how you were full. Yes, we have some specific experience you know, around working with people on the, exactly that issue. And it's very rare you come across a truck or a train that is full on weight and on cube. Um, there are very few measures, so there's actually very little real data that's available as to how full things are, which is one of the big issues. Um, that ought to be a priority for academic and other studies, actually understanding where the problem is. Um, but clearly, that's an area where it's possible to coordinate and collaborate something. And I think that area of building on that, particularly the road to start with, I mean, for me, the, the logic here is that um, if I was one of the you know, various internet startups that was coming up in these areas, it's much easier to operate in the areas of um, you know, a road because you're building on a very, the very flexible network that uh, Eric was talking about earlier. You don't have the constrictions of whether it's you know, national regulation or whether it's individual players that maybe you have on the rail system. I think one of the models for us, we look at, again, we look at air. And so that used to be a very constraint. So when I was growing up, you know, if you wanted to fly from A to B, well, you had you know two options. You had the national flag carrier of country A or the national flag carrier of country B. Those were the only options that existed. And I think with the Open Skies Agreement, um, and then the rise of things like low-cost airlines and flexible pricing models, all the things that Eric was talking about earlier, that again becomes a model of how these things work, and other software can sit on top of it in order to optimize the whole system. Um, I think that the challenge for us when we get into modal is to follow a lot of those and say, how do we remove those constraints from the infrastructure so that somebody as a startup, it would be attractive to sit on top of a rail system when you know that you know one decision maker with a stroke of their pen can make or break you. <laughs> um, and say, so how do we copy some of that across from, from one avenue to another? But so I think there are a number of, of these examples where things are getting better. And I think where, whether it's the, um, the visibility, it's particularly the visibility of the opportunity, less for me, less tr critical to actually track the thing in en route. It's more critical to actually have visibility of the empty spaces that are available. So and the ability then to book things at the last minute so you can take, take them up. And for those sorts of systems to move from road freights to other ones, because with, with, you know, with a, with my hat on when I look at and say, well, you know, carbon footprints, one of the things that worries me is that I think the efficiency of the road system is, is moving faster than the efficiency of the other systems. So actually, you know, if there's a challenge moving things into modally now, that gap is getting wider rather than narrower because the road system is so flexible. Uh, but maybe one of the other big opportunities in the cities where we can see the challenges in terms of the, the pollution levels and the congestion levels meaning that a city authority may take a decision and say, guys, I'm sorry, if you want to deliver to this place, you have no choice but to come through a particular hub or node in order to maximize and, and to take unnecessary trucks off the road. Okay, Eric, what is your yes, preferred? Yes. Or 
where, where do you suit the, the potentials of, of clusters? So if you say, okay, this is really one one thing that can that has the potential to move forward. I think that what uh, if we want to look forward, and um, I hope we'll have a news in the, in the forthcoming months. But uh, uh, one thing uh, that we did in, in clusters, and it was what was asked, was uh, intercity or interclusters. If you want, if we want to provide a full solution, we sh should reach cities as well, and city yeah. centers. And I think that uh, I, and I saw the recent development uh, in Switzerland with uh, Cargo Souterrain, which is an underground system with um, a size that is not so far from uh, an MLU. Uh, you know the unit load that they have. So I, I think that step after step. We, we we start to depict uh, a picture. We, we we don't have the big picture yet, but uh, we have building blocks in different directions. And one of them, uh, as you mentioned, Michael, uh, is the fact that right now the market and is it quite the opposite of the sea and the air. The market is totally fragmented. So our starting point is quite different from air and uh, sea shipping. We are not starting from a lack of solution. We are starting from, <laughs> we are overwhelmed by solutions. Yeah. And this is quite a barrier as well. And for that, I think that a better visibility, uh, uh, and I mean by visibility, a real time visibility on the traffic of freight traffic over Europe will help a lot uh, shippers, carriers, and the world community to reach a better view of what is going on and what is feasible. Because as it is today, you go from A to B and you think that you're mostly alone to do it. But when you if you have a, a map where you can monitor the flow and you see that, no, not at all, <laughs> you are many. And uh, then uh, it may change, uh, and maybe many at the same time. So you have no arguments against no, it's not my, it's not my schedule, it's not the no, 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 it's, it's going right now with you. Um, and uh, in line with that, we uh, we have a, a a project in France with Orange. And what we want to do is to track SIM cards, sure. because in each truck or light duty vehicle right now we have between one or three SIM cards. <laughs> One for the driver, one for the vehicle itself, one for the TMS, uh, at least. And um, if we have that visibility, then I think it will help to uh, rise the the consciousness about what's going on and what we could do. And that it could help uh, align with what uh, Fernando said, I think, on the demand side. It could help to change the mindset about no, no, my demand is specific. I am alone on that. And it, come on, uh, <laughs> look, <laughs> have a look. Uh, and uh, when you go for vacations, we are all in the truck, and we can see that we are all stuck together. <laughs> and then we adapt our comportment. Uh, we change our behavior. But for freight, we don't care. We we know we are, we are never there. We, we we are not aware. And there is someone who does the job, and we. They will ask him if he is pleased or not, if it was too full or not. We don't know. So the awareness, I think, is uh, one of the next level among uh, all the, the good the good topics that we addressed already. So thank you very much. I always hear this word of visibility, visibility. So this this seems to be the the, the magic world, and I think this this can be then. Uh, it's a lot about, let's say. Um, Let's say bringing the, the parties together. Uh, let's say exchanging information, getting down transaction costs, making the uh, the processes more smoothly so that they, they are much better um, uh, organized, coordinated, synchronized. So I, I think this this can all be the same measures in order to to continue them. So um, we have this magic world of synchromodality. Okay, so it's 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 there since since years. Uh, but I think what what we have heard right now goes a lot in this in this direction. So and we have we have the need, I would say, 
to look for for business models then for new business models how this how this could be set up and i think here startups could could be something like this we have we have the need for let's say internal changes so that's that uh, let's say in a kind of let's say natural development path that 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 companies are moving towards these so that physical internet ideas of i mean who is uh, yeah having shared physical internet hubs so this is this is something which is actually not implemented yet so and this would need for a kind of agreement on assets and technologies that that you will use so this this could be then also a, a driver into this and i think uh, eric is promoting some of uh, i think here these ideas are written down in this in this book <laughs> physical internet <laughs> uh, moving to japan it, it is looks like japanese version, if you're interested <laughs> So these are the these are the and and from my view. So I, I would I would like to close now this webinar possibly with the last round of uh, of, of statement. Um, um, from my view, it is we are for me it's personally the the idea of physical internet is getting much more mature now. So after this ending of of uh, clusters 2.0, I think we we reached now a level where we can say okay. Um, um, I have really an idea. I have really something where I can say, okay, this is this is how it is developing. Um, possibly there are some some ideas which are which are not that much collaborative. Uh, there are not ideas which are not so more so much modular. However, I, I think right now we have achieved with cluster 2.0. I would call it a kind of toolbox where we where we can go as a kind of handcraftsman to somewhere and uh, let's say consult we can we can provide him some insights we can show him uh, figures achievements algorithms tools uh, a lot of things we can we can show him how we can how we can move forward so this is a little bit practical it's not just this much academic but it's practical however for me for me this this level we have achieved um it is still the question so how to scale up so this is this is this is the, the big question for the future however from my side i would say we have we have achieved now at the end of this project a kind of uh, a promising level i would call it uh, how to continue we have a lot of knowledge created we have a lot of tools uh, provided and i think with this with this we can we can now get into the next levels please uh, i would i would ask for your statement so making a, a last last shot round along uh, um, um, yeah among the three of us giving your statement and then uh, i would say then we close this this webinar michael please okay thank you marcel i think i think for me a couple of things so first of all picking up on the comment eric made earlier about more reusable packaging i think you know there will be we look at all the plastic waste which we haven't talked about as one of the other challenges in the world at the moment and reusables will be a part of that. So I think there's a there's a move away from single use packaging towards reusable packaging. And I think reusable packaging is our friend when it comes to the physical internet, uh, because it enables us to invest in something that's higher specification that's, that speaks to either technically or otherwise to the things around it. Um, so I think that will be um, a big trend forward. I think fundamentally there are two challenges. I think there's, there's one key challenge, which is, um, with all that's been achieved in clusters 2.0 to identify what is the area that is reasonably large where there are fewest of the disablers where we're nearly at the point where it could tip over into being a um, a commercially viable investment and what needs to happen to make that happen to create that real lighthouse image of saying you know when these barriers are not there here we can achieve really big and glorious things and then I think the second area is that there are some fairly formidable institutional barriers around this sort of collaboration, particularly, I mean, I'm not the expert on the rail system, but on, on some of those big um, rail infrastructures across there. And unless some of those are addressed, then I think that the, um, the total value of something like clusters 2.0 is always going to be limited. So for me, it's, it's two parts. One part, which is find the area that's easiest and make it happen, turn it into a real lighthouse at scale that works, deliberately bypassing the big barriers if we can, and just making the most of what we've got. But the second one is saying, okay, let's recognize those big barriers and recognize that those we need to find a, a separate route to try and take those down. And if we do the first one successfully, 
hopefully it'll inspire the, the demolition of the barriers in the second area. Thank you, Michael. Very good points. Eric. Oh, I clicked on the wrong button, but uh, I'm still here. <laughs> uh yes i think that within closer you're right marcel and uh we did a, a lot of things to deliver some kind of toolbox with uh many tools uh valuable tools inside the big question is um now we should think like virus we should find the entry point <laughs> yeah and replicate <laughs> maybe we are too big to think like that but uh i think it's really the the point um I'm not sure I have the, the, the crystal ball to say what is the, the, the best entry point. I think that um, all development I, I, I around the, the right intermediaries, um, a development of intermediaries platform, it could be a very good in, entry point to make the, for, the offer much more available for many players. And my second point is I think that if NMLU could go to city centers, it could have a lot of value uh, and ease to shipment at different levels before they reach city center. And uh, it could be also um, a nice entry point to test, uh, except with new uh, transportation means. But uh, again, I don't have the, the crystal ball and science is quite different from uh, crystal ball. So uh, I, I have no idea which is gonna be the player. We're gonna catch the ball uh, the first, uh, but, I will um, be ready to help to investigate uh, the different ways. And I think to have different ways, different paths uh, still uh, alive uh, to find the entry point is, is a good strategy. Fernando. I'm very much uh, aligned with uh, what it has been uh, said in terms of the outputs and outcomes of uh, cluster 2.0 but it's true that it's very uh, specific uh, uh, initiative looking and developing some tools that can help but are some tools so the cluster 2.0 is not providing the tools there are many other tools that they are developing in other in other projects that need still to be developed i think the contribution on how this cluster's environment could contribute to, to uh, physical internet or how physical internet thinking could contribute to operate uh, uh, clusters uh, in a different, uh, more efficient way that's what has been achieved. But there are many other areas like corridors or like cities or even which is the actual uh, role of terminals and ports in, in delivering this um, and these uh, values or, or these concepts that there are still to be developed. Okay, thank you. I, I think your your final words, let's say, um, um, paved the way again to to the follow up seminar webinars that that we will ha help here. And uh, so the last one, let me. Okay, um, so we will have another sequence of of, uh, of webinars. So starting with uh, with the slot booking app that that will be um, on on the thirtieth next week. So this is Tuesday. So it's cloud based platform collaboration in airports. So we will go for the NMLU. So uh, I think we have we have addressed quite good thoughts about so what is the potential of this NMLU within this webinar. So we can dive more detailed into this into this uh, technology on the 2nd of July. Then we have uh, um, uh, the let's say the potentials of model shift, and also here we said about uh, let's say the, the problem the potentials, but also the problems that we have in using the rail system or let's say efficiently integrating the rail system in this whole physical internet and supply chain ideas. This will be addressed on the 7th of July. Uh, then we have this cluster community system, so this visibility approach, uh, making making intermodal transport operations more visible. This will be on the 9th of July, and then I say the, the way for the green deal. So what is the potential in terms of greening the supply chain? This will be addressed on the 14th of July in the final webinar in this cluster 2.0 session. 
So we have already reached uh, and exceeded by five minutes the time for our webinar. But I, I found this uh, discussion that we had uh, very, very fruitful, very good. Um, I know that you have been followers for, for the Clusters 2.0 project over, over the years. So and uh, you were very much engaged in, in, uh, in, in our activities, be it in the European high level industry group, be it in the, uh, in the Alice group. So, um, and I thank you then also very much for, for these three years of support that you have provided to us and, and, and your feedback. And uh, let's say this, this kept us really in, um, in uh, continuing on, on, on developing the solutions and uh, also receiving your feedback on that. So thank you very much then uh, for accompanying us then also over these three years and uh, having this uh, final, final webinar right now. I think out of the discussion, it came clear, so I mean, you, you are really into the topic and uh, we could really develop some very good ideas where I thought, okay, um, what to do right now with, with, with this development, but I think there are some really ways forward how to continue and I think it needs some expertise, some, uh, um, um, some, some knowledge about and also some senior, yeah, senior knowledge uh, to continue on that and I think we, we addressed this and we provided this in this webinar. So therefore, from my side, thank you very much. And I also thank those participants that are still with us in this in this webinar. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, uh, please, let's say, have a look at our website. So we continue then this webinar series uh, with the detailed uh, links and, and timings of the webinars that, that we will see you soon. Thank you very much then. And thank you then also for you, for the three of us, helping us in setting up this webinar. And um, hope we can continue on the ideas that we have just developed in the near future. Thank you very much then. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.